Okay, very good. Hi, I'm Mike Tenefoss. I'm the uh, VP of Strategic Partnerships for Aruba Networks. Been with the company for about seven years um, and responsible for managing the relationship between Aruba and Microsoft. Um, it's a very deep relationship. Um, in addition to deploying Aruba Wi-Fi across Microsoft sites across 60 countries, MTCs and elsewhere, uh, we also have a technology collaboration and uh, it really started around Link. Uh, as you can imagine, since Microsoft already had Aruba deployed, uh, they were gonna run Link uh, starting with 2010 on Aruba infrastructure. And questions came up about quality of service of Link on that infrastructure. Um, one, of the, one of the great strengths of Link is that it's encrypted from end to end. And from a networking perspective, uh, one of the great conundrums is that Link is encrypted from end to end, and it breaks all the quality of service mechanisms that you expect um, in, in the network. So um, uh, packets get mistagged, uh, voice doesn't get differentiated from instant messaging. It it's really could be a mess. The second thing that complicates things is the introduction of multimedia devices like Surface and iPads and smartphones, where Putting a device on a VLAN is no longer an assurance that it's going to be on the right VLAN and have the right quality of service. Uh, if you put a multimedia device on a data VLAN and then you launch a link call, well, that's wrong. And if you put it on a voice VLAN, you're going to be wasting bandwidth because if you're spending all your time on instant messaging, that, that uh, reserved capacity could have been used for something else. Uh, plus, those devices dynamically shift. So you might have instant messaging going to desktop sharing, going to voice, going to video, and so on. So the world of mobility, the world of multimedia has made things very complex. So we engage with Microsoft to address this issue. And the, the first nut we cracked, our kind of phase one, was looking at how can we fingerprint or identify a link video or voice flow from a data flow without decrypting it. That is, maintaining the confidentiality of the information, but still picking up heuristics that would cue us and say, uh, this is voice or video. Um, the second step, and, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, because that, that still has a really significant ramifications for those of you using Office 365 or, or considering it. The second stage was to get even more data out of the uh, link infrastructure and combining it or mashing it up with the networking data so we could provide end-to-end -end diagnostics. If somebody was roaming and they were talking on their, on, on their Windows phone and a call drops, it was really important for IT and telecoms managers to know, did it drop because of a problem in the client, in the server, uh, um, inc incorrect setting in, in the LAN, or because there was inadequate Wi-Fi capacity. Uh, but the world at large, the UC world, was flying blind. Yeah, you could get visibility in the link server, but the network was uh, kind of a big black box. So we set out to address that as well uh, with Microsoft. The other trend that's been uh, looming and is now actually upon us is software-defined networking. And that's a market texture, right? You, you can talk to 15 different people and get 15 different explanations of what software-defined networking is depending on whether they have a product yet or not. Uh, the way that we look at software-defined networking is that the network needs to adapt to users, applications, devices, and locations dynamically. The fabric of the network needs to adjust. In Wi-Fi, the most precious commodity we have is bandwidth because you can't just make more. So we have to preserve it for those applications and users that need it the most and decrement the priority uh, of those that are, are doing um, or running applications that are not latency sensitive. But the same thing applies to the switching fabric and to the applications, to the northbound firewall. All of these different elements need to come together so that the overall resources that are available to you in terms of the networking infrastructure, the servers, and the application performance can all adapt to what you're doing uh, in real time. And not just you, but all of you who are running in, you know, around uh, mobile, working from home, everything, the whole networking infrastructure needs to adapt. So you have this confluence of growing mobility, uh, lower reliance on fixed wired infrastructure, applications that are latency sensitive um, and yet are 
business critical like Link, and then this need for the entire network fabric to adjust automatically. So all of these are coming together, and this was driving the most recent work that we did with Microsoft on software-defined networking API. Um, the reason for the, uh, the title of this talk, uh, by the way, let me just back up for a second. How many of you are running Link today? Okay, how many of you are not? That would be easier. So everybody, oh, one person, okay. So almost everybody's running Link today. How many of you are running Link instant messaging over Wi-Fi? How many of you are running Link voice over Wi-Fi? Okay, well that's actually a, a much bigger number than last year, so that, that's great. Um, one of the challenges is when you go from running instant messaging over Wi-Fi to enabling your voice licenses and running voice and video over Wi-Fi, you have a completely different set of expectations and requirements on the part of the networking infrastructure. Instant messaging is not latency sensitive. You won't notice it if you get a few milliseconds, tens of milliseconds of delay. But your ear will pick it up if that happens with voice. And um, uh, Aruba is one of the world's two largest Wi-Fi companies. The other company, which shall not be mentioned, um, has a completely different design and different architecture in terms of the way uh, that they handle latency sensitive uh, infrastructure or, or applications. We're really focused on mobility as opposed to having come from the wired infrastructure and having a very fixed VLAN based uh, solution. So back to the original question on running instant messaging versus voice. A lot of business, link business that has come Aruba's way has come from customers that were running instant messaging, link instant messaging just fine on their Wi-Fi infrastructure, and then they enabled voice, and things went to hell. Uh, roaming calls dropped, they got jitter, uh, they had very inconsistent results across the infrastructure. And the reason for that is because they're very different requirements, even in terms of access point spacing, capacity, the ability to uh, share loads between access points when you get very heavy usage on voice versus instant messaging, which, which really the network can run on fumes for handling instant messaging. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I wish I could say that uh, most of our Fortune 500 link wins came because they selected Aruba initially, but in fact, most of them came because they enabled the voice licenses, uh, networks collapsed, and then they came to us to do a proof of concept to see if what I'm talking to you about today really does what we say it does, and, and it does. It really does work. So the first thing is, uh, can your network talk the talk? Is it able to handle voice communications? And the second is, can you walk the walk? Do you actually have true mobility in your site? It's one thing to make voice calls from your laptop at your desk with your headset and you're just in a fixed location. It's something completely different when you're using a mobile device with a Link 2013 mobile client running on a Windows phone or an iPhone and you need to walk around your campus, whether you're a physician or an academician uh, or you're uh, a salesperson that's trying to close a deal. The ability to roam puts very different requirements on the infrastructure than just staying in one place. At the end of this presentation, I'll talk about the importance of a link mobility readiness assessment. It's not good enough just to say, you know, I think my network is pretty good because I've had this performance in the past. You actually really need to dive in uh, if you're going to do a true mobile voice deployment and look at whether you have all the right infrastructure in place. Um, anybody here have a sports car or ever driven a sports car? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. Probably like to drive them at high speed because that's, that's what they're designed for. Uh, would any of you, uh, say, take your Porsche or your Ferrari or whatever you got, Veyron, and uh, drive it, say, 100 miles an hour over a road full of potholes? Anybody enjoy doing that? No, probably not. Uh, no, not Reddit. <laughs> Good question. No, this is a personally owned car. No, you, you probably wouldn't do that. Uh, how many of you would take that car and drive it at 100 miles an hour in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic? Probably wouldn't do that either, right? It's not going to be a good experience for the car or for the others around you. Link is a high-performance vehicle. Okay. Not only does it need to have smooth pavement, it needs to have an HOV lane that it can move in and get around all the other traffic uh, that might be congesting the roadways. And so 
you need to have infrastructure that allows that to happen. That's the only way to achieve the best benefits from Link in a mobile environment. And it's often very uh, overlooked. These factors are overlooked because, again, the assumption is I had a good experience with my old applications on Wi-Fi, but no reason it shouldn't be able to support Link. So when we uh, do a readiness assessment, there are really three levels that we're looking at. One is, hey, you've got good roaming, you've got good security, you've got good signal to noise, you've got good access point spacing, you're good to go. Whether it's on Aruba infrastructure or any infrastructure. The second is a yellow flag that says, you know what, you need to investigate this more. It doesn't look like you have adequate capacity. So voice spacing of access points is roughly 12 meters, let's say, uh, which ends up being about 2,500 square feet. Uh, for instant messaging or just data, you might go to 15, 18 meter spacing, okay, which was adequate before. So yellow means you might need to add more access points in your infrastructure. And red means you've got some real failures here in, in terms of being able to support it. Maybe you, maybe you don't have the closet infrastructure to support the gig -E connections to the latest generation of Wi-Fi access points, 802.11ac which uh, can run at 1.3 gigabits per second, so faster than, than wired, uh, wired Ethernet. Um, we just released last week our first outdoor 802.11ac, which also runs at 1.3 gigabits per second. So you can actually roam between buildings, you can roam in parking lots, um, in sports facilities, which are probably one of the most demanding applications that are out there. You have 50,000 fans that all want to get real-time video. That's very demanding. You need high-speed performance. So there are, there are a few essential requirements here. So what do you need in order to, to allow you to talk the talk and walk the walk? Well, the first thing is you need to be able to identify and prioritize those latency-sensitive packets. And the next two slides, I'll talk about that in some more detail. Um, the second thing is you need to have capacity uh, in the network. And the network needs to be smart enough, and the fabric of the network needs to be smart enough that loads can be transferred between access points if all of a sudden uh, a lot of people start launching video uh, or, or voice in, in a particular area. One of the uh, dirty secrets in the Wi-Fi industry is that sales are sometimes made on the basis of the number of APs. So it's almost chest thumping to come in and say, well, I can do this entire deployment with only 15 APs where uh, Aruba might have recommended 30 APs. Well, there's a very good reason that you should investigate why we might have recommended 30 APs. It's not because the sales guy is trying to boost his quota. It's because access, Wi-Fi access points should always be designed with overlapping coverage, meaning that if, and run not at full power, but run at three quarters or half power. And the reason is if an access point fails, you want the other access points around it to automatically be able to increase their power and cover that gap, because it does happen. Antennas uh, sometimes get knocked off of APs in, in dorms or other settings where there's construction going on. Uh, PoE connections sometimes get removed or switches get turned off. So it's really important that you design for resiliency in the network. So if, if, if a price looks too good to be true, you really need to investigate what's going on there. Well, one of the other reasons besides resiliency for having this overlapping capability is so that you can also do load sharing within the Wi-Fi infrastructure. So if I get this surge of latency-sensitive traffic, the network should be able to move those, that other traffic to other access points nearby and share the load to balance that so that you never get to a point where the network management system flags you and says, you know what, you're over capacity. You, you need to drop another AP into this area. The third thing is, um, is roaming, fast roaming. And this is not just related to the Wi-Fi infrastructure. Um, I'll say that client device companies, uh, I won't single out Apple, but let's just talk about them for a moment, um, have really bad device drivers that are built into, the, into their um, operating system. And by bad device driver, I mean the design center for them was a consumer application where you're roaming within the range of a single access point but you only own one, and so you want to stay connected to it. And that's great in your home, but that's not great when you're roaming in an enterprise 
because it means that once you connect into an access point, once that smartphone connects to the access point, and you launch a call, and you start walking away from that access point, that device driver will not release. And sometimes it won't release until the call actually drops. So you might have started out with a 200 megabit connection, and you get to one megabit, and then it's gone. Well, th that's horrible, right? That's horrible from a user experience. So what are you going to do about it? It's completely unreasonable for uh, a networking infrastructure vendor to say, oh, I want to put a software application to address that on the, everybody's smartphone. That just won't fly. Nobody will do that. So the infrastructure has to be smart enough to deal with roaming clients. So how do you do that? Well, one way you do that is the network has a bird's eye view of everything that's going on in that network, knows the signal to noise ratio of all the clients and the closest APs to them. So as the network sees that that, we'll use an iPhone as an example, that that iPhone signal to noise ratio is dropping, dropping, dropping on this access point, but it's increasing on that one, then we can force a reconnection to that other access point without waiting for the driver to do it. So we can basically correct bad behavior on the part of the driver by using infrastructure techniques that will allow the call to continue. You might hear a blank uh, um, for, for a second, but the call won't drop. And so we can allow you to roam freely even if the driver itself wouldn't allow you to do that. The second thing that we can do, uh, I'll come to your question in, in a moment, and feel free to ask questions along the way. The second thing that we can do is that we can ensure that that driver doesn't impede a high-speed phone or tablet or a laptop from connecting at the fastest possible speed. One of the other bad habits of drivers, and I won't mention the particular fruit vendor that does this, um, is that oftentimes if a phone or a tablet that's able to go operate in the 5 gigahertz range, the 11N AC range, at high speed, defaults to 2.4 gigahertz, the slow speed, the old Wi-Fi. And the problem with that is, number one, you bought this fast racehorse. You're not able to run it at full speed. But also, um, if an 11B-like device joins the network, the other devices around it will slow to match it. That's part of the standards, so that everybody uh, basically adopts to the lowest common denominator. Well, that's atrocious from a performance point of view. You have an 802.11 AC access point that can go 1.3 gigabit per second. You have a smartphone that's capable, or a, a tablet that's capable of going 500 megabits per second, and now everybody's running at 15 megabits. That's crazy. So how do you correct that without putting a new application or asking somebody to update a driver, which isn't going to happen? The way that you do that is that you manage the way in which that device connects to the, to the air. So in Aruba infrastructure, what we do is we probe the device, the smartphone or tablet, and we say, are you able to operate at 5 gigahertz? And if it says yes, we deny it access at 2.4 and force it to go up to 5 gigahertz. If it won't relinquish, if it won't relent, if it won't give in and it just refuses to connect at 5, we'll still allow it to connect at 2.4. But we'll do our darndest to try and get it connect at 5 gigahertz to allow it to run the way it was supposed to, even though the driver is holding it back. The other thing we'll do to prevent this lowest common denominator phenomenon is we will allocate the amount of air time, that is the actual transmit time that that device has on Wi-Fi. So if you have an 11N enabled phone, you'll get 16 times as much air time as an 11B device. So everybody will get on the air, but if you're able to operate faster, you're going to get more air time than that slower device. And so that's called airtime fairness. So there are things that we do in the infrastructure to allow roaming and to allow higher speed performance without forcing the consumer, the user, the enterprise IT group to go into that device and force an upgrade, change the software, et cetera. Now, we also work with all of the major client device vendors, client and smartphone vendors and so on, to try and get them to test their drivers before they release them in an enterprise environment so that that won't happen in the future. But still, there's a big installed base. So you had a question. Yeah.
so the question is, how do we know basically uh, what, from the client's perspective, what the performance of that is? Um, we're able to tell, uh, first of all, from the speed at which that device is operating. Basically, it's, um, it's getting a strong signal, it's not getting a strong signal, et cetera. There are also standards that are underway to allow us to actually reach into the device to get its perspective on the network and get this two-way uh, um, exchange of, of information for more intelligent roaming. Were there any other questions? No? OK. Um, BYOD. Let's, let's, BYOD means bring your own device to work. Let's just talk about uh, personally owned, enterprise managed devices. This is a, a big trend these days, and it should be. Um, why not? If a cellular provider is willing to underwrite the cost of a new phone every two years, or in some cases more frequently than that, there's no way that you as an enterprise can capitalize the equipment that fast. So why not take advantage of their largesse and allow people to bring their own smartphones into the enterprise environment? There's just one catch, a security. Uh, if, uh, if my kid's been doing BitTorrent and Tor and all kinds of stuff with my smartphone at home before I bring it into the office, how do I know that it actually is secure and it isn't going to exhibit uh, unfriendly behavior on my network? So it's one thing to have, talk about the physical layer, interoperability of devices and fast roaming and so on, but you also always have to keep in mind those devices have to get on the network and they have to be secured while they're on the network and they have to go into specific policy or roles while they're on the network so that they play well with others and they, they, they don't misbehave. Okay, uh, jump to the last bullet here, which is end-to-end -end visibility. It's great to talk about all this wonderful infrastructure that we can put in in these shiny new white access points that are going gigabit per second and so on. If you don't have visibility into how that network is working, you have no way to remediate problems. You have no way to do proactive um, uh, steps to ensure that that network will run at 6.9's reliability. And the problem in the past with Link is that the network was this black box and also a black hole where there was no visibility. If a call dropped, you didn't know why. Was it because of roaming? Was it because of the switch, et cetera? So as part of this SDN, Software Defined Networking, um, work that we've done with Microsoft, we've actually been able to extract all the link call data through the new link SDN API and mash it up with all the networking data that we have on the switches and on the wireless LAN and present that as a complete dashboard. So you now have end-to-end -end visibility from the client, from the, uh, from the uh, smartphone, laptop, tablet, all the way back to the link server. And we actually, in our management tools, show you a bar at the top showing each of the network components. And if they're all green, you know that path is good. And if they're red or yellow, you know that there's a bottleneck here or that something's actually broken. This is probably the single biggest pain point that we hear about after uh, it doesn't work on Wi-Fi. It's, well, when I get it working on Wi-Fi, I have no insights into how my network is performing. And so, if you really want link over Wi-Fi, it also means that you want visibility into how link is working on Wi-Fi and how all those thousands or tens of thousands of client devices are working uh, in your local site, in your site across the world, without having to do a truck roll to figure it out. So I mentioned there were two phases to the um, R&D work that we did with Microsoft on link starting about three years ago. The first step was flow-based control. This is where we actually looked and, at the packets that were being transmitted and we fingerprinted them and basically said without decrypting them, this is voice, this is video, and then set the quality of service for that. The SDN API, this new um, uh, capability that's uh, being talked about pretty widely at different sessions here, came out after this, but this capability is still really important if you're running Office 365 because Office 365 doesn't provide the SDN API capability. So if I'm deploying across branch offices, for example, if you're a bank or hospital clinics or real estate offices, et cetera, and you're delivering Office 365 services, you still need to have the quality of service even if you only have one, two, five, ten access points per branch. And so this capability gives you that. It gives you 
whole quality voice and jitter-free video in those Office 365 applications. The second phase is the SDN API. And this is really the all-in-one fun center because this is where you get all of the features uh, in terms of diagnostics, visibility, uh, call stats, et cetera. So the link uh, server has this new uh, SDN interface. Uh, it connects to the Aruba controller, which is the black box in the middle. And uh, what we get is we get proactive call information. So when a call is being set up, we get access to that, and we get all the call stats after that call has been completed. And we take that information, and we combine it with the information that we get from our um, access points that are located on the site. We get it from remote access points that are being used for telework and so on that are uh, setting up an IPsec tunnel from a remote site back into the infrastructure. And we get, for example, immediately we know which flows on a particular device are voice or video or desktop sharing or instant messaging. And we can assign, based on your priority, actually you assign it, uh, what the priority will be. So for some customers, desktop sharing is just as important as voice. That's how they do collaborative um, work, say, between engineering departments or between marketing departments that are located at different sites. That is a top priority. Well, you can set it that way. Instant messaging, I don't think anybody's ever set that as a top priority because you don't notice when it's slow. Uh, but voice, definitely. And so what will happen is if you're working on your um, Surface, for example, you're doing instant messaging, you, you now launch a voice call uh, from that device. That flow, that voice flow, uh, will, will be getting the voice priority based on information that came from this um, API, through this API when that call was being set up. If you then launch desktop sharing in the course of the conversation that you're having, we'll also get that information from the API and we'll assign the appropriate quality to that. And we do this for every flow on every device, for every user at every location in real time. This is a massively scalable solution. Um, Aruba cut its teeth when we started about 11 years ago on two things. One was the security of our infrastructure. We go all the way up to classified top secret over Wi-Fi. And on the scalability of our networks, which is why Microsoft and Google and SAP, actually all the social media companies, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of them use Aruba for their uh, corporate facilities. They're massively scalable. And with the uh, advent of the Link SDN API, these capabilities are now massively scalable as well for delivering the quality of service. But it doesn't stop there because now you also get the post-call statistics and the diagnostics. And that is essential for health of your network over time. If somebody does have a problem, chances are you're going to get a proactive notification from the Aruba infrastructure saying, we have an issue with overcapacity on this particular access point, or at this particular location, this switch has gone down, or there's a PoE that's been unplugged. You can also go back and do call uh, reports. So you can look, for example, that fruit vendor that makes all those smartphones and tablets. You can look and see how often uh, that particular brand of product generated uh, mistagged packets, or how often calls dropped on that particular uh, brand or on specific devices. So all this information is broken down for you and displayed in very easy to use uh, GUIs. So you get the uh, quality of service for all link flows on a flow-by-flow -flow basis, which is something you can't do with a VLAN. You get um, CAC, you get the real-time monitoring, and then you get the historical reporting. If, uh, if any of you are fortunate enough to be Aruba customers, all you have to do is upgrade to the AOS 6.3.1 uh, software, and you'll be in business. You now have access to it. You don't have to do hardware replacement in the field. You don't have to do controller replacement in the field. Yes? The question is, uh, do the post-call statistics go beyond the controller? They go all the way from the link server. They include the link server, the LAN, the wireless LAN, and the client device. All of them are covered with the post-call statistics. 
no, it, the LAN doesn't have to support the SDN API. We pull the data from the switches. We get data from the switches. Yep. Uh, it's done by the Aruba controller, and I have to get back to you on the question about can it be done by area. That I don't know. Stay new here. Yes. The controller does the QRS marking, and it also uh, corrects mistagged packets as well. So one of the biggest problems is uh, the switches don't recognize this information, and they'll mistag the voice call because they're not configured to tag it correctly. We'll know that that particular call is voice, and we'll retag it. No, you don't. The question is, do you have to apply QoS to the device itself? No, we do that in the infrastructure. You don't have to go into the particular device and change something. Yes? Oops, sorry. It starts when it gets to the first AP. Okay. So uh, this this capability is available today. This is not uh, not future. So this is back to the the whole issue of diagnostics, and I think uh, somebody was asking, where does it start? Well, it's got to start where the call started, right? So it has to start at the client, which could be going through an Aruba remote access point by VPN uh, back into the, uh, into the data center. Could be through a remote small office system, branch office, corporate office, wherever you have either a remote access point or the access points. So you end up getting this visibility all the way. Today, you can't do that. Before this uh, SDN API, you just didn't have that kind of visibility. You knew something about what was going on in the linked server, but you didn't know beyond that uh, where the problem was. And, and now you now you do. So here's a, a, a brief example. Um, if you want more details, if you want to see exactly all the screens that we show, please come to our booth, which is 515, and we can run you through all of them. This is just a summary. Um, so for example, uh, this is showing a, a quick snapshot of call quality broken into uh, the client health, meaning how is this doing on the Wi-Fi infrastructure? Is it, does it have a good connection, for example? Is it performing well as a Wi-Fi device? And then what's the call quality uh, effectively by MOS score? And so uh, you can get a glance that says, you know what, I got some problems down here. Everything should be up here. I got some problems down here. Uh, I'm going to click on this particular call and find out what the problem was. And this is where you can find out, for example, by operating system. You know, this particular device is not roaming well. Calls are always dropping uh, whenever this device roams. And then you can take necessary steps. Um, this uh, slide right here, or this uh, area, is showing that we have an oversubscribed access point. Um, there were probably not enough access points that had been deployed in that particular area. So there are too many calls. Uh, for the 25 concurrent uh, users here um, generating 250 calls over some period of time. Uh, we'd like to see another access point put in that area so that there can be load balancing, for example. Uh, this is breaking it down uh, with quality of service, which ones are having uh, the most issues and the fewest issues. Uh, also by device over here in terms of uh, uh, the, the total breakdown of devices in your network. So you might have a lot of iPhones uh, in the network, but they could be causing a proportionate, a disproportionate quantity of quality of service issues. And then uh, this is showing you a quick snapshot of how many calls are stationary versus how many people are roaming at any given time. And you can dive down into details on all of these. There, as I say, there are an awful lot of uh, statistics that we're providing in the infrastructure. One of the benefits of moving to um, Link 2013 to the mobile clients is A, it runs on any platform, so that's great. You can go to your entire installed base and have them download the Link 2013 client. But that also means there's some low-hanging fruit for cost savings because 
the more users that you have that are migrating to Link 2013, the fewer requirements you have for wired IP phones and for wired ports, period. So we recommend when you deploy uh, Link 2013 on mobile clients that you go back and do a survey of your infrastructure to see how often your wired ports are being used. And you'll probably be shocked. Um, surveys that we do or that customers report to us find that wired ports in many cases haven't been used in over a year because all of their users are on uh, Wi-Fi on laptops or Wi-Fi on smartphones or Surface, et cetera. Um, and the savings are huge. So Gartner did a uh, what we call a right-sizing um, assessment of the California State University system when they did their last Wi-Fi upgrade. Went from uh, they were moving over to 802.11n and found that this is a 27 campus system, about 600,000 students. They could save 30 million dollars by consolidating the closet infrastructure into fewer switches, taking the unused switches and putting them in a spare parts pool canceling the service contracts on those because they don't need them now. They've got all this, the spare parts pool. And this was pure low-hanging fruit. Didn't require big architectural analysis. They just figured out which ports were no longer being used, disconnected them, consolidated the ports and, and the switches. So the benefits in terms of productivity, innovation, collaboration from, from Link, you know, w I'm sure we can all talk about that uh, in great detail. But this is one of the added side benefits that come from the mobility that Link 2013 brings to you. These savings can be massive. And you're probably hearing about it from us because we don't have that big installed base of switches that we're worried about losing, right? We are a Wi-Fi company. Yes, we do make wired switches, and there are a lot of benefits to using our switches, but we don't have this big legacy installed base. Uh, you know, the world was created in seven days. Very complex task, but there was no installed base, right? So it was very easy to make the change. Same thing here. Uh, you can make the change if you're willing to open the aperture a little bit and say, how can I look at my network architecture differently in a mobile world versus what I was doing five years ago or 10 years ago? And, uh, and you can become a hero in your group by doing that because these savings drop right to the bottom line of the organization. So when I started, uh, I was trying to impress upon you the importance of understanding what you've actually got. You might believe that your Wi-Fi infrastructure is just perfect. You can enable your voice licenses and move to full mobility, no problem, and you might be right. Uh, but you also might be wrong. And so it's really important before you enable uh, full mobility on your infrastructure that you go through and you do a mobility readiness assessment and look at uh, roaming performance, signal strength, you look at network security, uh, you look at co-channel interference, uh, whether it's microwaves or nearby uh, Wi-Fi networks or other fixed frequency signal transmitters that are, that are present. Aruba has um, um, signal analysis, uh, spread sp or broad spectrum signal analysis built into our access points. We'll identify if there's a microwave oven or a deck phone or something else that's interfering with your, with your signal. But it's better to find that out before you actually deploy rather than wait to get a trouble ticket and do the spectrum analysis at that time. So this really will pave the way for link success. And we can point you to um, partners that will do this. Uh, or if you want to do it yourself, we can show you how it's done. But it's really important that you do this in advance because it will make the entire transition that much faster. So <clears throat> the appropriate theme, actually we've been using this graphic for a while, but it's appropriate for Las Vegas. This hotel, by the way, is an Aruba hotel. All, all, the Wi-Fi, not for the show, that's, that's another brand, but the hotel itself is all, is all Aruba. So you can get all the benefits of, <laughs> of the productivity, the innovation, the collaboration benefits of Link if you give it that smooth runway, the roadway surface to run on and you also allow it to go in the high occupancy vehicle lane and bypass all the other traffic that's out there. And the way to do that is to recognize that it's actually a link flow that's going and recognize that it, uh, there's a difference between the requirements for voice and video and desktop sharing and IM and uh, prioritize accordingly in the infrastructure. 
You can also make sure that this investment that you're making in Link for your employees are gonna become wholly dependent on it. Aruba, we, at our corporate headquarters, we don't have any wired phones anymore. We are all Link all the time, only on mobile devices, and it's phenomenal. But you have to make sure that you've put in the diagnostics and the operational efficiency to make sure that it runs at six nines availability all the time. And that's why having the SDN API and that interface that mashes together the networking data with the link data is so important to make that happen. And then finally, through the mobility assessment, you need to make sure that you're preparing the way for the next year, two years, three years, to make sure that your users have a good experience no matter where they work or roam. There was a question here in the front. So the question is, uh, I, I said that Aruba doesn't use any more wired phones in our uh, corporate facilities. How do we deal with um, conference rooms? So we use uh, link conference systems. So uh, I guess maybe that might be one exception where we have uh, uh, polycom systems that we use in our conference rooms and I, I suppose they probably have a wired connection. So that might be the exception. So we have no desktop phones. Okay. Uh, for, for uh, Link. It was, by the way, it, it, it's a little scary. Uh, for those of us that have been working with Microsoft for years and have a lot of deep experience with Link, the transition was seamless. But there were a lot of people that are so dependent, they just think, if I'm gonna make a call, it better have a corded handset on it or else I don't know that the call's gonna go through. So it, uh, we did a massive education program um, throughout the company, both on using link over smartphones and tablets, but also getting away from those paid conferencing services, go to meeting and so on, that people had been very accustomed to using forever. And, and surprisingly, I guess I, I found it surprising, people just raved. They were so happy. Uh, IT would get uh, you know, complimentary messages about, you know, now I can do desktop sharing where I couldn't do that before. I mean, once you show users the benefits of link and they actually dive into it, you really will find that it's a fantastically productive tool. Was there another question? Yeah. Question is, how much visibility do you lose if you don't have Aruba switches? Um, most of our customers don't have Aruba switches. So the information that I was showing here is not dependent on using Aruba switches. Um, two of the benefits that you'll see from Aruba switches. Uh, one is our networking infrastructure has a built-in policy enforcement firewall right in the Aruba controller that provides very fine-grained control over what you can do, where you can go, when you can go there, what you can look at, and so on. So nobody trusts Wi-Fi, right? I mean, it's open, it's insecure, so you've got to put in encryption and security and policies. We know that. There's a false sense of security with wired switches. I mean, the number of times I've gone into a site, unplugged a printer, and plugged in a laptop, and said, right through, right? I can go wherever I want to. You can't do that with Aruba switches, because those same policies that are applied to the wireless infrastructure now apply immediately to the wired infrastructure. You don't have to do anything. They just automatically load it in. So that's one benefit. That also means that Joe Sixpack, who installed the cabling, can also install the switch, because there is no configuration of the switch. It's all pushed from the controller. So there are operational savings and there are security benefits. But let's face it, I mean, we're not the best known switch supplier. I hope someday we will be. So that's just today. Tomorrow might be a different story. But we live in the world of Cisco and HP and, and, and Brocade and Arista and, and so on. Actually, uh, on that subject, it just reminded me on software-defined networking. So uh, we're sharing this information with the link server through the SDN API. But we also have other partners uh, that we share that information with as well. So Palo Alto Networks Firewall, for example. We share information. So as soon as a, a device comes on our network, we'll notify the northbound firewall that this device has now come on the edge, and therefore it can set application control policies immediately rather than waiting for that device to request something. We also do the same thing with, uh, with Arista and with Brocade um, for, for SDN and uh, other partners coming soon. There was a question here. Uh, the question is, is this data available on Airway? I love that question. Uh, 
the next version of Airwave will have all of this information. I think it's seven, it's either 7.0 or 7.4. The, the next release will have all of this. Right now, the screenshots I'm showing you are on the controller. Airwave, by the way, is our network management solution. Uh, just to give you a little background on it, uh, Aruba had its own proprietary network management system that was all Aruba all the time, but it only did Aruba. And during the transition from 802.11bg to 802.11n, we knew that a lot of customers were not going to rip out all of their existing BG devices and install our 11n APs, that there was going to be a transition period where they might be running their, their legacy Cisco Wi-Fi together with new Aruba Wi-Fi at the same time. So uh, a multi-vendor network management solution was really the way to go, but that was not our, uh, in our wheelhouse. So um, we bit the bullet, we discontinued our own network management product, and we bought a company called Airwave that makes multi-vendor network management. And uh, that became our standard. And it turned out it was a great decision because most customers didn't do a rip and replace of the entire infrastructure. And we gave them a very graceful way to make the transition without ripping out everything they'd already done. Uh, our competitors were saying, look, if you want to go to 11N, it's got to be you know, the next generation product and so on. We didn't have to do that. That's also true for BYOD. So um, we have a product called ClearPass that does automatic onboarding onto the network, um, automatic policy enforcement, and also security mitigation. So to look at the device and determine does it have the latest security patches. If you, if you ever go through San Francisco International Airport and you know the horrendous experience that existed six months ago trying to get onto their Wi-Fi versus what is going on now where it's one second you're on and done, that's the difference between the old way of doing it and ClearPass. So we acquired uh, a company to do this uh, BYOD because again, it was not in our wheelhouse. And now we have, we think, best in class BYOD solution. So that was a long-winded way of answering your question. Is there another question in the back? No? So the question is, are we using ClearPass data here uh, to uh, provide information on policy? It's a good question. Everything that's described here was controller-based. Uh, I guess it might be supplemented by ClearPass, but I actually don't know the answer to that. So if you'd like to stop by the booth a little bit later, I'll get somebody who can answer that question for you. Any, any other questions? No? OK. I, I think I probably finished early. Thank you very much for coming. We're in booth 515 if, uh, if you have any questions. And by the way, if you don't want to stop by, but you do have a question later, uh, link ready at arubanetworks.com. Any question you have about link, um, be happy to answer it. Thank you very much. <laughs>